We have seen in the previous session that all our attempts at decomposition were failing because of one reason or another. In this session we are going to introduce a new tool in the Functional Programmer's Toolbox, Pattern Matching. We will show how Pattern Matching is a good fit for the problem of decomposition. So remember, the task we were trying to solve is find a general and convenient way to access objects in an extensible class hierarchy. The class hierarchy we were looking at was those of arithmetic expressions. We had a base trait expression. And then we had subclasses for number and sum. And then later on we also added subclasses for product and variable to that. And in terms of methods, we were looking at eval that would evaluate one of these expression trees yielding its results, as well as show, that would show a string representation of the expression tree, and then finally simplify, which would do some algebraic simplifications of an expression tree. If we've seen three attempts previously, and they all had some shortcomings. The first one was the classification and access methods, and there we observed the quadratic explosion of the methods we had to write. In this class hierarchy here, there were 40 methods that we had to write. Uh, the second one was type tests and type casts. That did the job, but it was unsafe and low level. And the third one was object-oriented decomposition. Uh, that worked great for evaluation, Work, worked also great for show, except that we had to touch all the classes to add a new method but it didn't work for methods such as simplify that require non-local knowledge of the, uh, of, the, of the tree. In this session, we will see a new way to decompose objects using pattern matching. An important observation here is that the sole purpose of test and accessor functions was to reverse the construction process. That means when we construct a node such as uh, new sum, of E1 and E2, where E1 and E2 are expressions, then we pick a particular class of node, sum, and we pick the arguments. And the purpose of decomposition is to recover what kind of constructor we used for the node, that it, whether it was a sum or a number, say, and what the arguments were. And that situation is in fact very fundamental and common, so common that many functional languages, Scala included, automated. And the technical term for this automated solution is pattern matching. So we get pattern matching in Scala by way of case classes. A case class definition is essentially just like a normal class definition, except that it's preceded by the modifier case. So we write case class number instead of just class number. As before, this defines a trait expression and two concrete subclasses number and sum, but we get some added functionality by adding the modifier case. The first thing we get is that the Scala compiler will implicitly and automatically add companion objects, uh, one for number and one for sum, and those companion objects will contain factory methods that construct numbers or sum elements directly. You've seen last week that you can create factory methods like that simply by adding an apply function to an object because that will let you then write something like, for instance, number of two. You've seen last week that this term actually expands into number dot apply of two. So it will invoke the apply method that we have defined in this object. The gist of it is that you can then now construct objects simply by naming the class and the arguments, whereas the new keyword here you can drop. So that's a syntactic convenience. But the original classes that we have here are now all empty. So how can we access their components? And that's what we need pattern matching for. So one way to see pattern matching is as a generalization of the switch statement from C or Java. In C or Java, a switch can only be applied to numbers. Now we can apply it to whole class hierarchies. In Scala, we use a slightly different syntax. Instead of switch E, we write E match and then come 
a number of cases. So to express eval using pattern matching in Scala, what we would do is we would say, well, match the given expression with a number of patterns. The first pattern would say, well, if it's a number of some given value n, then return that value. The second expression would say, well, if it's a sum with some operand e1 and another operand e2, then evaluate the two operands and form the sum. So it's quite legible. So the general form of a pattern matching expression is as follows. We start with a selector expression E, then comes the keyword match, and then come a sequence of cases. Each case starts with the keyword case, a pattern, a right arrow, and an expression. And the meaning of such an expression would be that the selector expression E is matched against all the pattern. The first pattern that matches would then lead to the corresponding expression being evaluated. And if none of the pattern matches, you would get an exception, which is called a match error. So what are patterns built from? One pattern we've seen was number of n. So that consisted of a constructor that indicated a class and a variable that indicated the argument to that class. And in that case, the argument to, to that class could be any integer. We don't restrict that in the pattern. Uh, we could also write number of underscore. That would match the same things as number of n, but we wouldn't care what the argument was, whereas in number of n, the name n then serves to give us the numeric value of that number. An underscore just means it's a don't care. You don't, you, you cannot refer to it later on. Uh, patterns can also be constants, such as one or true or ABC. Or there could also be a constant, such, let's say n, where n was like defined as well n equals two. So you can use name constants as well as constant literals. And then you can take these building blocks and compose com more complicated map patterns from them. So one example for that would be a pattern that reads as sum of, uh, let's say, number one. And the second operand would be a variable x. So that would match objects which are sums with a left operand that is a number, and the number needs to have a numeric value 1. And the right operand of the sum needs to be a node of type var, and the name field of the var can be anything, but after the pattern in the right-hand side where we then use the expression, we can refer to x as the name of that variable. We'll see an example in a minute. So here's some of the fine print. One tricky bit is how do we distinguish a variable such as n, which can match anything, from a constant such as n, which in this case matches just the number 2 and nothing else. Syntactically, we need to find a way to distinguish one from the other. So the convention Scala uses here is that variables always must begin with a lowercase letter whereas constants should begin with a capital letter. The only exceptions here are the reserved words null, true, and false, but these are literals that the compiler knows about. There's another restriction on variables, and that's that the same variable name can only appear once in a pattern. So, for instance, sum of x, x is not a legal pattern. You'd have to write sum of x, y instead. So now we know what the form of match expressions and patterns is. The question is, how are they evaluated? So let's take an expression of the form that we've seen. That would match the value of the selector E with the patterns P1 to Pn in the order they're written. On the next slide, we'll see what that means exactly, matching an expression with a pattern. If a pattern matches, then the whole expression is rewritten to the right-hand side 
of the first pattern that matches. And when we do that, the references to pattern variables in the pattern here are replaced by corresponding parts in the selector. So what it, does it mean that a pattern matches an expression? Well, we look at the possible forms of patterns to determine that. Let's say we have a constructor pattern, so there's a class name and some arguments. That would match all values of type C, or a subtype of type C, that's also legal, that have been constructed with arguments that in turn match the patterns P1 to Pn. If, if the pattern is a variable pattern x, then that matches any value and it also will bind the name of the variable x to this value. So in the, in the associated expression we can then use x as the name for the value that it matched. And the third case was a constant pattern c, so this one matches any value that is equal to c, where equality is understood in the sense of equals equals. So these rules might have sounded dry and difficult, but it will all become clear if we look at an example. So let's look at an application of our evaluation function, which I have put up here on the side, with the tree sum of number one, number two as an argument. So the first thing we would do as usual is rewrite that application by the body of eval, where the actual argument replaces the formal parameter. So the result is this expression here. The e variable here gets substituted with the actual argument sum of number one, sum of number two. The next step is we have to evaluate the match expression. What we need to do here is we have to match the selector expression against all the patterns. Uh, the first one doesn't match because the constructor is different. The second one does match, sum matches sum, and that means that the two variables e1 and e2 will be bound to number one and number two. And after that the uh, expression, whole expression will rewrite to the right hand side expression here, which is evaluate one plus evaluate two. So that means we're left with eval. Now instead of e1 we, we would use number one, the uh, value that was bound to the variable, and instead of e2 we use number two. So the next step then would be that we have to rewrite the function application on the left here. So what we get here is this expression here. We have a selector of number one and the match expression which is the right hand side of eval and then that's the rest that we have to add to the result. Now if you look at the match expression then now we see the first pattern is the one that matches. The number is the same thing here. The variable n gets bound to one and that's the thing we return, so one is the number we return. And afterwards we need to do an eval of number two, which will give two, as by the same reasoning as what we've seen just now. So the whole result is three. So far all our pattern matching methods were defined outside of the class hierarchy, so where they were decomposing classes from the outside. But it's also perfectly possible to have pattern matching methods inside the class hierarchy as methods of base classes themselves, such as the eval method that you see here. So that is just the same as the previous eval method, except that now we match on the receiver object itself. So you see a list.match. And instead of writing eval of e1 of e here, it would be e1.eval because eval is now a method of of uh, the trait expression. Either one is perfectly acceptable. Once we've done that, you might also ask, well, what are the trade-offs to do it this way? Or with the previous object-oriented decomposition solution we've seen, where we had essentially the base trait expr and a def eval, which was empty, and then in sum there would be a def eval which was concrete and in number there would be another. Both of these designs are perfectly fine and choosing between them is sometimes a matter of style but there are nevertheless some criteria that are important. One criteria could be are you more often creating new subclasses of expression 
or are you more often creating new methods? So it's a, a criterion that looks at the future extensibility and the possible extension paths of your system. If what you do is mostly creating new subclasses, then actually the object-oriented decomposition solution has the upper hand. The reason is that it's very easy and a very local change to just create a new subclass with an eval method, whereas in the functional solution you'd have to go back and change the code inside the eval method and add a new case to it. On the other hand, if what you do will be create lots of new methods, uh, but the class hierarchy itself will, will be kept relatively stable, then pattern matching is actually advantageous because, again, each new method in the pattern matching solution is just a local change, whether you put it in the base class or maybe even outside the class hierarchy, whereas a new method such as show in the object-oriented decomposition would require a new implementation in each subclass. So there would be more parts that you have to touch. So the problematic of this extensibility in two dimensions where you might want to add new classes to a hierarchy or you might want to add new methods or maybe both has been named the expression problem. The name actually comes from this very example of arithmetic expression which served as a case study for the discussion. Let's finish with an exercise. Uh, we've talked about the show function. I would like you to implement it uh, so what I'm after is a show function that takes an expression and gives you a string that represents that expression. Okay, so let's see how we would do that. What I've given you here is uh, the uh, hierarchy consisting of the trait expression and the two case classes number and sum that we've seen in the course before. What we're going to do is a worksheet in which we are going to implement the show function. So what sh we should show be like? Well, we would want to do a pattern match on the expression. And then we would have two patterns. One was number. It could be any number x. And the other one would be some, call it left and right. And uh, in each case, we have to decide what we want to return. In the first case, we would just convert the number x to a string. And in the second case, we would just concatenate uh, the result of showing the left-hand operand with a plus in the middle and the result of showing the right-hand operand. So the show expression itself would have type return type string. So let's test the function with some argument tree as expression. So I would do show of, uh, let's say, the sum of uh, number of 1 and number of 44. What would we get? Well, we would get the string 1 plus 44 as expected. So if you haven't had enough of it yet, uh, here's another exercise for you, which is optional and much harder than the first one. The question is, if you add case classes var for variables and prod for products, how would you have to change your definition of show? The challenge here is to get parentheses right. So let's say we have a tree such as a sum of a product of uh, a number 2 and a variable x. I'm not going to bother write numbers and variables uh, in, in the, the tree form. Then what you would expect is that you could print that just like 2 times x plus y. Whereas if you reversed it and you had a product of sum of 2x and y, then what you'd want to see is 2 plus x in parentheses times y, because otherwise, if you would just write 2 times x plus y, that wouldn't reflect the structure of this tree. So the challenge is to put in the right number of parentheses, the minimal number of parentheses, so that the structure of the tree is reflected in the output string.